That is a shadow on the sky. Of all videos posted online, one video has left viewers totally spooked. I usually post at least once a month, so if I don't see any, uh, or if you don't see any posts from me, you know that I, they got to me. Welcome back to the channel. Here we go. In the past 20 years, several people started noticing strange patterns and phenomena that are being coined as a glitch in the matrix. And right now, I'm going to show you guys some of the best glitches caught on camera this week. Starting with the Dash Man on TikTok, a profile who is focused on recording hiking trips and beautiful scenery, that kind of stuff. In this particular video, he records an anomaly on a lake. As you can see, it seems that something is bending the fog and the lake, and he clearly captures it on camera. He states that he has never seen anything like this, and he's 33 years of living next to this particular lake. Whatever's going on here, it seems that no one knows how to explain this. Some suggest that this could be a cloaked UFO, or maybe even a portal to another dimension, or military testing of some sort. <laughs> In this next video, fish started pouring from the sky, literally. Now just picture this, you're at a beach, enjoying your time with your friends, and all of a sudden you notice what looks like a shadow on the ground, but there's nothing casting that shadow. Creepy, right? In this next video, a person freezes and stays like that for quite a few minutes. No, Wait. <laughs> what the fuck is Babe, stop cussing. Wait, she's not moving at all. That's what I'm saying. What is going on here? Some people are theorizing that this could actually be an NPC caught on camera. Check this out. What is she looking at? What is she doing? That's actually really That's concerning. Creepy. I don't know what's going on. <laughs> you know, I've seen a lot of TikToks with like glitches in the Matrix, but this is this got to be top dog for me. A few moments later. Look, is no one seeing this? What is going on? Look, even That's looking. crazy. Look, no, no, she's, looking, no, she's looking. Look. What? <laughs> it's interesting if you study history, all of the ancient civilizations, the Babylonians, the Sumerians, the Greeks, they all are the Chinese, they just arose out of nowhere. Poof, there's a civilization. There is no evidence of this stuff they teach in school, of them going from hunters and gatherers and grunts and groans, you know, caveman stuff, becoming civilized and building cities. There's no evidence of that. It's the farther back you go, it's all of a sudden poof, there's the beginning of the Egyptian civilization. The beginning of the Chinese civilization, just like they moved in and built it in less than 100 years. So, some strange things have been found in the fossils, uh, as in the ground, that would indicate man used to be really smart. This little airplane, for instance, is in the Smithsonian, I believe. It was found in a grave in Colombia. It's about a thousand years old. But it's an airplane, quite obviously, with all the features of an airplane. They knew about flight. In Peru, they've got giant stone walls like the one in the picture here. These stone walls are phenomenal. Some of the rocks in there are so huge, we can't even move them today. How did they move that? Who, who, who did it and how did they do it? I don't think it's logical to say ancient man was primitive. They must have known something we don't know today. That is a shadow on the sky. Is that even possible? I don't understand it. Some weird clouds. And then there's a shadow behind the clouds. But like, the sun's there as well. So what is going on there? So some people think that they're too clever to be conditioned. You know, being conditioned is just for the weak of mind. But look at this for a second. What do you see? Is anything jumping out to you or is it just a series of random blobs? I'm gonna show you what it is in a minute, so don't look at the comments just yet. 
just take note of what you think you see. Okay, so if you weren't sure what this picture is, hopefully now you've got a clearer idea. It's a cow! Some people will have seen the cow straight away. Whenever I run this exercise in person, usually like one or two in 30 can see the cow. But most people can't until they see the red line. Now I'm going to show you the original picture again. Can you still see the cow? The answer is probably yes. These pictures are from a book called Everyday Bias by Howard J. Ross, and they demonstrate how fast our mind works. Because now that you can see the cow, you can't decide not to see the cow. You can't force your brain to go backwards. Now that that information is stored in your unconscious, you have no control over the fact that your brain is projecting that knowledge onto this image. You do not choose how your brain takes in and processes information. You are not in control of your cognition. Believing that you are too smart to be conditioned is incredibly dangerous. The fact is, your brain is taking in and processing information at a rate that you can't even comprehend. There is no person on this planet who doesn't have unconscious bias. It's part of how our brain works. There's no binary of people who have been conditioned and people who have not. There's just different ways that people have been conditioned. And there's people who have been exposed to things that allow them to change some of that conditioning. If you put different information into your brain, then your conditioning changes. Being intelligent doesn't change this process. Honestly, a lot of the time it just makes you more likely to double down on your biases. <laughs> Taking a curious and creative approach to life is something that will expose you to a wider variety of information for your brain to process. And that's where innovation happens. Not because you're too smart to be conditioned, but you are curious enough to work with your brain and give it new avenues to explore. This is the latest initiative from the president of El Salvador. He is putting all these prisoners to work. All these people are being put to work for a positive cause. That's everything from garbage collection to actually cleaning up the beaches and other initiatives, including growing their own foods. The thing that I like is they're actually fixing and painting and working on publicly funded buildings. That means it's no longer the taxpayer dollars that is paying for it. It's actually the prisoners who are then funded by the tax dollars anyways. This is called the Zero Leisure Plan. And as part of that plan, they are growing their own food that they will be eating in the prisons as well. From construction projects to you name it, everyone is being put to work. And the president saying that they need to repay the debt to society. Hey dad, do an impression of Joe Biden trying to explain the difference between tangerines and oranges. T tangerines, I was a kid growing up. This was in uh, Kentucky. Civil War just ended. And there was a tree. Uh, uh, my father planted the tree. Uh, t t tangerine tree. Anyway, uh, Abe Lincoln said, I'm gonna cut down that cherry tree. No, no, the other guy. Uh, anyway, what was the question? When you start to pay attention around you in an urban environment, you'll start to feel like Sherlock Holmes, uncovering small, seemingly insignificant mysteries that you can then solve. And I wanna show you a particularly satisfying one I stumbled across today. It's this yellow metal bar right here. It doesn't seem like official city infrastructure, but it blocks your pathway if you're walking down the street. I'm outside of Portillo's here in Chicago. First assessment, which is true, but only partially true, is that you'll see that it forces you to walk around it and pay more attention to this blind drive, the drive-through that's coming through here. But almost every block in Chicago has a blind drive like this. Why does this one have it? People naturally don't walk this close to the wall. So all it's trying to do is to get people to pay attention or walk this far away from the wall. Now you'll also notice there's a sign that says, hey, here's the drive-through with traffic. There's even a mirror to make it easier for cars to see the pedestrians that might be making a bad choice. But solutions that include signs and mirrors like this aren't enough in part because the very people who are walking close to the wall are probably people who aren't paying attention. So that state of inattention is what puts them in danger and what makes this sign irrelevant. So you put this here. But again, why here? There must be a higher frequency of either drivers driving inattentively or people walking inattentively. And this is our next clue. Look at this trail of this dark stain right here. This is likely an employee entrance. An employee with a leaky bag of trash is gonna make a beeline to the dumpster, which includes walking along this wall. This increased frequency of a person making a blind choice, coupled with the drive-through increasing the traffic in this alley, is what makes this corner particularly dangerous. Remember earlier when I said it makes you feel like Sherlock Holmes solving insignificant mysteries? Well, this one actually points to a larger truth. And that is, when the stakes are high, we can't rely on signs, we have to rely on design, and here's why. Nobel Prize winning psychologist 
Kahneman, and Traversky point out that we spend most of our day on a sort of autopilot, our brain functioning in a system they call System 1. But whenever we're awakened by something that's unfamiliar or out of the ordinary, we shift into System 2, which is more rational and problem solving. System 1 is necessary for us to get through our day and is pivotal to our survival. But in modern context, it often puts us in danger. And in this case, this employee is in System 1 doing something they do every day, which is taking out the trash, increasing their speed in which they take out the trash since the bag is leaking. And you need something that bumps them into System 2. And that's what this is. You're breaking someone out of their instincts and forcing them into their rational mind, which decreases the danger. This is why you hear adages like, too many signs shows a lack of design, or paint is not infrastructure. This painted bike lane is not keeping the city employee from parking in it. And a lot of times, this probably wasn't even a rational choice. This restaurant could have said, this is no longer a driveway, but instead, they have three physical objects enforcing that. And just a block away from that last bike lane is this, a fully protected bike lane, which is obviously some absorbed some trauma from cars. Again, if that city employee tried to park here, that curb would have jolted them awake and say, not right here. It wakes you up from instinctual action to rational action. It bumps you from system one to system two. Now we get this when we're designing infrastructure for cars. Never see a bridge like this going over a river or a chasm without guardrails and just a sign that says, beware of the edge. Good design recognizes vulnerabilities and minimizes the behavior that exploit those vulnerabilities. Intersections are incredibly dangerous for everyone involved, drivers, cyclists, pedestrians, and you can design these intersections for maximizing throughput of cars or safety of all parties involved, but you can't do both. So in a city where there's a certain level of density and a higher population, the need for getting somewhere quickly by car is decreased and safety should be increased. Pedestrian crossings should be more than just signs hoping that everyone's paying attention. It can include more passive design that enforces slower behavior. Good design doesn't force good actions, but it does encourage it. Just like good design doesn't preclude bad actions, but it does discourage it. So in cities, we should be focusing on design more than signs that tell us to pay attention. Both because the stakes are higher, but also because as humans, we spend most of our time in system one, which doesn't require us to pay attention at all times. There's a small musician on YouTube by the name of Axel Loza, who usually uploads videos that showcase his musical talents. From videos that show what happens behind the scenes for a music video, to random clips of him playing music, there's no shortage of videos that display his musical skills. However, out of all videos posted online, one video has left viewers totally spooked. The video in question is strange, as it doesn't involve anything related to music, like most of Axel's videos. Instead, it starts off with Axel's brothers waking up in the dead of night and staring off into the distance. Immediately, we can tell that there's something off about this video. Axel explains that he and his brothers had woken up after hearing strange noises coming from the closet. They were staring at it when suddenly, after looking closely, they saw something that left them completely shook. This is what they saw. Aquí están mis hermanos. Y desde hace rato se quieren dormir, pero están viendo la misma cara que yo. Es lo que me temía. La verdad es lo que me temía y no sé qué hacer. No se pueden dormir. Y vean, aquí está, pero cuando yo trato de abrir, no hay nada. No hay absolutamente nada. Behind the closet's window pane, a ghostly face can be seen. But when Axel heads over to open the closet, he finds no one inside. It quickly disappears as soon as Axel opens the door. The camera pans around all over the closet, showing no possible hiding spots for the supposed person inside. Now, of course, it could be that Axel is just a really good video editor and had cut the video to pull this off. But slowing down the footage where the cut or edit could have been made seems to show no signs of editing. So then, if this is genuine footage of something paranormal, what exactly was caught on camera? Like most videos, it seems we may never know, as no further information has been given. About the Earth I being this, flat, thousands was, I'm of scientists the same have thing. looked into it, you think they're all wrong? Most would be quick to call them idiotic conspiracy theorists, but what if they simply knew something we don't? What if we live here? A little bit, and when it comes around away from the sun, shouldn't it? He slowed down a little bit. But the laws of inertia, right, would argue that it's stuck in this elliptical. So you're, you're making up things because okay. you're trying to defend your position, which we all Well, know. I mean, the Globers will say that the gravity of the Earth negates the gravity of the Sun. So the Sun can hold on to the Earth, hold on to Pluto, 
but it can't affect the moon. You know who is in charge of all international flights? NASA. Whoa, whoa, whoa. NASA is in charge of Actually, all. Actually? And they run GPS. Not a single plane has, a commercial plane has flown over Antarctica? No, none, never. Whoa, and now why? Because you can't fly over Antarctica. Look at the Earth. They'll come, they'll come over Antarctica, and then they'll just come back. But there's so many pilots now that have spoken out, military and commercial pilots. A little bit too much for this my brain. This one's gonna send you over the edge. All right, Okay. no pun intended. <laughs> over the edge. Southern flights prove that that the Earth is not a ball. This is the World Cup soccer, oh. okay? They were in Doha, they wanted to go back to Buenos Aires, they went to Rome to refuel, and then they went back there. Why didn't they just go here? Because if they did, there's no place to refuel out here. On a flat Earth, Doha, Rome, Buenos Aires. <laughs> Taiwan the The greatest gift you have been given by creation, and I know this will sound funny to your ears, is that life is meaningless. What that means is you decide what things mean and the meaning you give to something, no matter what the situation is, is what absolutely and utterly determines the effect that that situation has in your life because that situation does not come with meaning built in automatically, although it may seem sometimes to be so because you're so automatically and unconsciously supplying a meaning to a circumstance, to a situation, that you think it just automatically must mean this, when in fact you have supplied the meaning unconsciously and thus gotten a reflection back of the fact that you have supplied that meaning and the reflection comes bouncing back so fast that you think it's actually inherent in the situation when in fact it's nothing but a reflection back to you. I like to meet a hoe who says, you know what, I'm a hoe, yes. I, I'm, a, I'm a prostitute, I walk the blade, I sell my body, and this is what it is. Yes. And you know what, I had the good fortune, I was just recently in South Africa in Durban, and you said something earlier that disgusted me, to be honest with you. You said, this is just what I had to do. You live in America, I go to so many countries and people would kill to get here. And they do what they actually have to do. In South Africa, it's the country with the highest unemployment on the planet Earth. I talked to a woman who's my mother's age who tried to solicit me for prostitution. And I respected the fact that she wanted to work for her money and earn her money. So I said, hey, I'm a podcaster. I'll pay you for a day's work. Let me interview you. I want to hear your story. Because people hear your story claiming that you had to do this. I talked to a woman who actually has to do this. In a country with the highest unemployment in the world. You're deluded. And you know what she said in her interview? She said, if I could go to America and wash dishes, I would go there and do that happily and send money back to my family. You see the difference between you and women there who are doing the same job of prostitution? They do prostitution in some cases because they need jobs. You do prostitution because you need God. You're lost. The person you think of as yourself exists only for you, and even you don't truly know who that is. Every person you meet, have a relationship with, or even make eye contact with on the street creates a unique version of you in their mind. You are not the same person to your mom, dad, siblings, co-workers, neighbors, or friends. There are countless versions of you out there in people's minds, each shaped by their interactions and experiences with you. Think about it. The you that your best friend knows is different from the you that your colleague sees. 
the you that your parents cherish is different from the you that a stranger glimpses on the street. Each person carries a distinct image of you, formed by their own perceptions and interactions. These versions can be influenced by a single conversation, a shared experience, or even a fleeting glance. Yet with all these different versions of you out there, the you in your own mind isn't a singular, definitive someone at all. It's a complex and evolving self-perception. There's a really common joke that goes, Wow, the first person to ever eat a lobster must have been really hungry. I mean, look at it. It's a giant, disgusting sea insect. And I've always hated that joke because we actually do know the history of why people started eating these. And it's really interesting. And it ties into a conspiracy theory I believe in, which is that I don't think anyone actually enjoys eating lobster. I think they've just been convinced that it's a high-class food for a really specific reason. As recently as the 1800s, lobster was considered a trash food for poor people, in the United States at least. They used to grind them up and use them as fertilizer. They used to feed them to prisoners. Dock workers once went on strike because they were being fed lobster three times a week, and that was too much. And the reason was, in that place at that time, lobster was really plentiful, it used to wash up on the beaches, and it was also high in protein. So it became established as like, this is our baseline food. If we run out of everything else, we've always got the lobster. But as a commercial product that you could like ship or store on shelves or serve in restaurants, it was difficult because lobster spoils really quickly. This is why in restaurants they have a tank of live lobster that they instantly cook. So because it was difficult to mess with and because it had to be shipped live, inside the country, away from the coast, it became known that lobster was difficult to obtain. And because it's difficult to obtain, it had to be expensive. And because it was expensive, we decided it was good. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying those people were lying. I'm saying the way the human brain works, you convince yourself it's good because it was difficult to get. Meanwhile, when I watch people eat lobster, they are dunking it in a giant bowl full of melted butter. You know what also tastes good when you dunk it in a bucket of butter? Anything. So I came up with Dr. Wallach's pig arthritis formula. Well, Harvard Medical School has laid in the bushes for me for 25 years, and they said, ha, we have finally found a way to prove that Wallach is a quack and a fraud and a charlatan, because everybody knows you can't regrow cartilage and bone. And they took what they thought was the most ridiculous one-third of Dr. Wallach's pig arthritis formula, and they gave it to 29 patients who had failed to respond in any way to heroic medical treatment for arthritis over 15 to 20 years. They took them off all their medication, wasn't doing them any good anyway, and the only thing left for them medically was joint replacement surgery. And they gave them a heaping tablespoon full of ground-up chicken chicken cartilage and orange juice every morning for 90 days, just three short months. And here's what happened. After 10 days, they had complete relief of pain and inflammation, something they hadn't had in 15 to 20 years. In 30 days, they could now open up a new pickle jar that never had been opened without pain to the fingers, wrist, elbows, and shoulder. And in 90 days, just three months, according to Harvard Medical School, not me, 28 of the 29 were clinically cured. Now, you'd think they'd call me up and say, Wallach, we got to apologize to you. That's not what happened. After three months, it was clear that the drug was beneficial, unquote. Chicken cartilage had become a drug in 90 days. Hey, if you're still here, please do me a favor and hit the like and subscribe button so this video gets recommended to other people. Thanks! One of the first questions I ask my students every semester is, do you care if your beliefs are true? Their response is almost always, what kind of question is that? Of course I do. But then I ask, well, what if one of your beliefs weren't true? Would you care then? See, that's when it gets real. And then I ask them, well, how likely is it that all of your beliefs are true? At this point, they kind of realize I've trapped them. Here's the point. It's nearly impossible that all of our beliefs are true. But if we want to align our beliefs then with what's true to the best of our abilities as humans to know the truth, then we need to scrutinize our beliefs. If they're true, they will withstand the scrutiny. That is, of course, if you care about believing what is true. Guess what? Our little blob made it to Newsweek, along with my video where I showed you how NASA satellite images block out an area where the blob appeared, as well as a strange antenna pattern that seems to be embedded in the ocean floor, northwest of our mysterious Bouvet Island that has no name on Google Earth unless you enter it, and often seems to be the origin point of the blob.
I had posted about bizarre cloud anomalies over Bouvet Island, and then posted when I learned that these are a rare cloud occurrence called Von Karman Vortex Streets. Well, I decided to go back in time, and when I reached February 2019, I found something truly astonishing. This is February 14th at 2 a.m., and this is 5 a.m. This does not look natural. It doesn't look like organic blobby weather. These seem to be parallel lines of activity, spaced evenly. They fade away. And when I went to look up weather for 2019, lo and behold, I discovered Calgary had one of the coldest winters on record. Yet the Earth's oceans had one of the warmest Februaries on record, in particular off the coast of South Africa. Here's where it gets freaky. Someone wrote to me suggesting I look at the time lapse of Bouvet Island on Google Earth. Watch what happens when our lovely little island gets to 2017. Poof! Gone! It's blued out. But here's the thing. It's not just blued out for a little bit. It's blued out for six years. Why is our little island blued out for six years? If the blob interests you, check out my entire playlist on the blob. See you in the comments. Take care. Richard, thanks so much for joining us here on Al Jazeera. Before we go any further, I just want to check something. Are you an atheist? For all practical purposes, yes. You... Uh, nobody can actually say for certain that anything doesn't exist. But I'm an atheist in the same way as I'm an a-leprechaunist and an a-fairyist and an a-pick-unicornist. So you're not 100% sure God doesn't exist, but you're sure enough to make it practically... I'm as sure as you are sure that fairies and leprechauns don't exist. And do you see an equivalence between the idea of God and the idea of a fairy and a leprechaun? The evidence for both is equally poor. <laughs> you say in The God Delusion, one of my favourite sentences that jumps out of the page, that the God of the Old Testament is a petty, unjust, unforgiving control freak, a vindictive, bloodthirsty, ethnic cleanser, a misogynistic, homophobic, racist, infanticidal, genocidal, filicidal, pestilential, megalomaniacal, sadomasochistic, capricious, malevolent bully. As a piece of rhetoric, superb. But do you really believe that? Congratulations on getting megalomaniacal right, by the way. Most people, <laughs> most people fumble on that. Yes, if you've actually read the Old Testament, I think you would have to agree. Uh, it is, it's hideous. It's an anti-the God of the Old Testament who is a monster. But also the God of the Quran, the New Testament, the Hindu scripture? Well, um, the God of the Quran, I don't know so much about. The God of the New Testament is widely advertised as being a bit, a bit more gentle. Uh, and certainly, on the whole, he is. There are things about the New Testament that I find, in a way, almost more objectionable than the Old Testament. Um, but the sheer horror of the character, I, I said he was the most unpleasant character in all fiction, uh, because I regard it as fiction, of course. Um, and yes, he is. I mean, he's, he's jealous, he's vindictive, he's callous, he's cruel. And yet uh, this is a god that is worshipped by, loved by, adored by, well, followed by millions, billions of people. Not. I hope not. I hope that the god that is adored by millions of people is a grown-up kind of god who is no longer... I hope that most people who... The kind of people I would like to know who worship and admire him regard those stories as not literally true. Now, there are some who do regard them as literally true. And uh, I, th I suspect they either haven't read the Old Testament or um, they're not the kind of people I would wish to know because, because you, don't, you do not win what, want to worship a character like that. By all means, worship some kind of um, great spirit of the universe, some kind of creative intelligence who, who created the universe, but don't worship this vile, vindictive monster of so the Old why Testament. So why, why throw around these sweeping statements about religion, 
not the God of the Old Testament, but religion itself being evil. I mean, do you believe religion is evil? Mm, no. But you say plenty of times in this book that religion is evil. You said in a speech famously that I think a case can be made that faith is one of the world's great evils, comparable to the smallpox virus, virus but harder to eradicate. I do think that, yes. Uh, because um, what I'm talking about there is faith, where faith means belief in something without evidence. Because if you believe something without evidence, then that justifies anything. You, you're no longer vulnerable to somebody coming back at you and saying, hang on a minute, let me argue the case. If you believe it without evidence, which is what faith is, then you don't argue the case. You say, no, I'm not arguing that case. This is my faith. It's mine. It's private. I don't, dis I don't dissent from it. I don't retreat from it. You're just going to have to accept it. Now, that is evil. And yet you spend so much of your time debating people of faith. So clearly people of faith are interested in having discussions. They're not just all blind believers insisting on their way of... Well, nobody said anything about all of them. I mean, the vast majority of religious people are perfectly good, nice people, uh, um, as you are. There, there's no suggestion I've ever made that all religious people are evil. Of course not. I just want to put this energy out into the world so I can guarantee it's out there. Police officers and politicians are not bad at their jobs. And if you catch yourself constantly wondering or constantly surprised at how bad they are at their jobs. What I need you to understand is their job is not what you think it is. So you say, well, police are here to keep us safe, to protect communities, support people, and uh, catch criminals, right? And to prevent crime. But you look at their records and you can see that that's not true. They only solve 2% of crime. Crime is highest in the areas that they have the most presence and they're incredibly ignorant on the laws that they enforce and they're in super violent and aggressive and usually racist. And you think, how bad are they at their jobs? And yet they're a billion dollar industry. You can't be that incompetent and that's successful. It just, it doesn't, it doesn't work like that. The police are incredibly good at their jobs. They're very effective at their jobs because they only have two. Number one is to feed the prison system and keep slavery going. Number two is to disrupt communities. Ask yourself why the only thing police ever seem to be ready for are riots. Because riots are an inevitable conclusion of oppression. That's always been their job. They need to be violent. They need to be cruel. They need to follow orders without thinking about it. They are being as aggressive as they are right now because they're scared. Because the real threat to all of this has never been violence. The real threat to all of this has always been community unification. That's why they are all working so hard to keep us down, to keep us tired, to keep us isolated, to keep us from talking to each other, to keep us from liking each other. Their job is to divide us. So the politicians can do their job of transferring wealth from us to the top. It's a simple game. But that's, that's the whole game. But the fact that they are all going in this hard right now with laws that they're passing, with the police that they are sending out, means that they are terrified. Because they live every day in constant fear that they will get their comeuppance. They know what they're doing is wrong and evil. They're just hoping that they die before they face consequences for it. That's why they act this aggressively this early on, because they're terrified of what happens if this grows. So as you are participating in and watching these events unfold, keep these things in mind. Building community is the most dangerous and powerful thing that we can do. They're not scared of riots. They're scared of us figuring out how to take care of each other. It's not enough to know what we don't want to be. We have to know what we are going to be instead. So keep each other safe. Keep each other connected. Don't give up and listen to native voices because they've been fighting this fight a lot longer than we have. Friends, gather around because I have just fallen into one of the wildest rabbit holes that I have ever found and it is causing my brain to currently short circuit and I have to talk to you guys about it. Also, I apologize if you hear any fireworks going off in the background. 
Anyway, you guys know who this rodent is. Yes, not the rodent behind him, the rodent right here, yes. And as you probably know, there were some recent documents unsealed in this man's case. I have noticed that a lot of large news networks are placing very valuable information behind paywalls, which I think is absolutely insane and ridiculous. News should always be free. I do encourage you to do your own research and stay updated and aware of what is going on with this man's case. Use the Wayback Machine override the paywall, keep yourselves informed. This entire case didn't just go away when the rat kicked the bucket. It is still very, very relevant and involving a lot of people who we see daily in society. So while I was reading through these new documents, I of course fell back into the never ending rabbit hole that is Jeff and Friends. And within this rabbit hole, I found something so bizarre and I am praying that this man is on some kind of a watch list. So I need to give you a little bit of background on who this guy is and then how he kind of ties into the Jeff and Friends case. Stick with me. This one is a wild ride. So this fellow right here is Dr. Jonathan Farley. And Dr. Jonathan Farley is an alumni of both Harvard and Oxford universities. And he has his PhD in mathematics and philosophy. Dr. Jonathan Farley has worked as a mathematics professor for MIT, Morgan State University, and Vanderbilt. This man created a company that works directly with our government to study terror and threats to our nation's security through better understanding the structure of terror or resistance groups through his expertise in the mathematic theory of ordered sets. Dr. Jonathan Farley also has a company called Hollywood Math, and Hollywood Math works with a lot of different TV shows and movies that involve science or mathematics to ensure that screenwriters are using proper terminology and theories. His company has worked on television shows and films such as A Beautiful Mind, Numbers, and Goodwill Hunting. Dr. Jonathan Farley is highly honored and highly respected in his field and has won some of the most prestigious awards available in his line of work. His most recent position has been working as a professor of mathematics at Morgan State University. And last year, Morgan State University opened up an investigation into Dr. Jonathan Farley after it was discovered that Dr. Jonathan Farley had sent an email proposition to none other than good old Jeff after he had been arrested for his horrific crimes. 2019, not long after Jeff had been arrested, Dr. Jonathan Farley sent an email to his personal email. And I'm gonna read you guys this entire email because it is so unreal. And it was leaked when there was a ton of emails between Jeff and other people leaked. And Dr. Jonathan Farley's was one of them. Parts of this email are obviously redacted because that is how it was given to the media. So just bear with me. Dr. Jonathan Farley wrote to Jeffrey stating, I can help you. I am now throwing you a lifesaver. You can donate to my university, the historically black college, Morgan State University. Our accepting your five million will show the world you are not a pariah and may help you avoid conviction like Bill Cosby. The donation can be made for the Jeff Epp Chair for the Promotion of Women in Mathematics, which will show the world your support for women. Alternatively, Blank gave three million breakthrough awards to two math professors. You can give me a similar award. He goes on to brag about himself a little bit more, then goes on to say, I am willing to publicly stand with you and your gift could generate support for you in the black community. Public support is something you sorely need right now. If you want to donate to a more prestigious university, the danger is they will reject your gift. But Lincoln College, part of my alma mater, Oxford University, needs 1.5 million euros for a lectureship in pure mathematics. I spoke with the head of college and the head of development. The latter said that accepting money from you would be a tough one for a UK institution. But if you funded me as an individual and pointed out to them that I could take up the lectureship for free, they might be open to that. The benefit to you is that I would then be an Oxford University lecturer and you'd have an advocate at one of the world's most prestigious universities publicly defending you. I could probably generate positive media coverage on your behalf as an Oxford donor. He then signs off with his personal information, which has been obviously redacted. So this professor was basically offering Jeffrey an exchange not a very good one. Jeff donates millions of dollars to this professor and then Jeff 
might have more likability in the media from the black community and could potentially avoid conviction like Bill Cosby. First of all, can someone check this man's hard drive? Because what are we even talking about right now? What do you mean you can help him avoid conviction like Bill Cosby, sir? Despite Morgan State University opening up an investigation into Dr. Jonathan Farley last year, according to their website, he is still working as a professor. Go to part two because this man kind of got his karma. <laughs> I've had this video for a while, but I've been scared to post it because what they might do to me. Um, I usually post at least once a month, so if I don't see any, uh, or if you don't see any posts from me, you know that I, they got to me. But um, I was at the museum and I saw this uh, where this Egyptian artifact where everything that was that we're meant to see is all properly intact and any details that we're not meant to see was chiseled off. Um, now if you notice any regular human being, uh, birds, boats, things like that, all properly intact and uh, in perfectly good condition, the regular human being right there. Now if you uh, look beside it, there's a much larger being. You can see the feet, the legs and uh, the body. Everything was chiseled off and you can see the head is like a lizard sh shape or crocodile shape or whatever. And any details about it was chiseled off. So they're hiding our history from us. I don't know who they are, but um, if I'm onto something, <laughs> they might come after me. Um, so, uh, if you know the, any detail about this, uh, maybe you can comment or stitch this video and explain. But uh, as you can see, it, clearly everything that we we're meant to see was properly intact, and anything that we we're not meant to see, we're all chiseled off by I don't know who. Any details about it? Like you can see the regular things, all there. But the other stuff that we're not meant to see, we're all chiseled off. There is something missing from Hollywood movies and TV shows. Something very obvious, but that I bet you have never noticed. Think about how many movies and shows we have, like The Last of Us, that are set in some sort of a post-apocalypse. In a situation where, among other things, they are always desperate for some kind of transportation. You often see them wind up on horseback because fuel is in short supply or they have to move silently and can't risk the sound of an engine. But there's one extremely obvious option that they almost never choose, and it's extremely telling that they don't choose it. It's the most popular mode of transportation on planet Earth, the bicycle. And the funny thing is, some of you are already saying, well, of course you're not going to show Daryl from The Walking Dead on a bicycle. He's cool. He has to ride something cool. But when as a culture did we decide that riding a bicycle isn't cool? And in fact, if the protagonist is riding a bicycle in a Hollywood production, it's probably a comedy. It is one of the most sharp and stark differences between film and real life, which is that in film, Riding a bicycle is almost always seen as a ridiculous thing to do unless you are a child or are childlike. And it's always so funny to me because we export our movies all over the world and I just imagine all of these scenes where the characters are trudging along a post-apocalyptic landscape on foot saying, oh gosh, there's, there's got to be a better way. And it's being watched in some city where everybody rode a bicycle to get to the theater. And I wonder if they look at the screen and it'd be like, there is. Is this also the I Like Children convention? I was curious about this as well, so I read two different papers on the psychology of pedophilia, and I read an article on the psychology of fame and how it affects people, and from what I can tell, essentially there are some correlational um, factors between pedophiles and content creators, and there might be some contributing factors when it comes to fame that results in this type of behavior as well. On the correlational side, there are some similar traits between people who are content creators and people who are pedophiles. Generally speaking, uh, pedophiles files the data is not very easy to discern because it is such a sensitive topic and the sample size isn't very big. So a great deal of people who did actually contribute to studies were generally people who were already caught uh, in certain types of criminal acts. So 
it's something that you kind of have to consider as being not necessarily sacrosanct, but there are some con converging traits. So for instance, pedophiles tend to have um, higher rates of anxiety. They tend to be more antisocial. They tend to have stunted emotional development. And for that reason, they have trouble bonding or connecting with or winning over a sexual partner that is of an appropriate age for them. And so for that reason, they tend to turn to people who are, for lack of a better term, easier, which includes children. For content creators, the general converging trait is that content creation can be a very isolating experience. So a great deal of people who create on YouTube, or people who stream on Twitch, they tend to be introverts who uh, usually just kind of stay in a lot and they create things online. So there are some converging traits between the two, but how does fame come into play? Well, when it comes to fame, fame can be addictive. Uh, fame can have similar effects on your body as a narcotic can. It can affect your mental state too, and it can even induce brain damage. So there is some correlational traits with pedophiles and addiction. However, I don't know if that data is actually solid or not. So I'm just kind of leaving that there for you to decide. But when it comes to content creation, what I do want to say is that when you perceive fame and recognition for what you're doing, it does not motivate you to change. So why disrupt something that's working for you? And for that reason, a great deal of content creators, they will get famous at a certain age and sometimes their development stunts because they don't want to change who they are. Charlie McDonald notes this. She said one of the reasons why she stopped doing YouTube was because it was a persona that she had crafted when she was 16 years old. And when she had reached her mid to late 20s, she didn't want to do it anymore. It just wasn't who she was. But for creators who are still creating after five, 10 years, and this persona that they've crafted for themselves is still working, sometimes there is a difficulty in separating one from one's performative self. That is another thing about fame is that it can kind of split you into two different people, your authentic self and the person that you are to the public. But also, if you're not working on your personal development or growth, what happens is, is that there are a lot of times where people who are in positions of power and fame don't realize how old they truly are, or they have trouble reconciling certain things that they should have reconciled if they had went through life as a regular person. For example, you might have a content creator who went through some experience that they didn't fully psychologically reconcile or recover from that happened to them when they were maybe 16 or 17. And now 10, 15 years have passed and they're in their late 20s or early 30s and they still haven't reconciled that problem. So they have formed an insecurity from that problem. And the way that they try to cope with this can often be by seeking validation in ways that they would have wanted when they were still 16 or 17 which can include being intimate with a minor. So for the content creator in question, if they're famous, that means that they are on one side most likely surrounded by people who are enabling their behavior because they don't want them to change. But on the other side, if they have cultivated a younger audience, that is going to present them with a great deal of power over a great deal of people who are impressionable and easier to manipulate. However, it does need to be understood that when it comes to CSA, only about 50% of those are genuinely due to sexual preference or fantasy or obsession. Uh, it's a bit difficult to talk about, but essentially under the DSM-5, from what I can tell, there is a difference between people who are only attracted to children, but also people who are doing certain things of depravity because essentially it's a way for them to display power or dominance and or find validation through any means necessary. So essentially what I'm trying to say is that the reason why this might be the case is because a great deal of pedophiles might be more likely to become streamers or content creators because it aligns with their own personalities. At the same time, one of the reasons why famous streamers might be getting caught doing this is because of a lack of psychological development, a lack of being well adjusted to the common like current world, an inability to find someone of an appropriate age, a lack of personal validation, or a innate desire to display power in a very perverse way. In the last few years, there has been a ton of discoveries that has revealed a new and almost mystical side of our world. For starters, some of you may remember not too long ago where a sinkhole was discovered in China that revealed prehistoric trees. Well, according to reports, scientists keep finding sinkholes that are revealing ancient forests, unknown wildlife, and even lost DNA. In Colorado Springs, a new species of mammal was discovered. And over in Africa's Sky Islands, over a hundred new species, including plants and animals, have been discovered that are not seen anywhere else on Earth. 
Now some of you may remember where I talked about a giant ocean being discovered 700 kilometers below the Earth's surface and a large blue hole being discovered off the coast of Mexico which experts were not able to reach the bottom of, but there has also been a discovery of over 100 new marine species in New Zealand as well as a new glowing sea creature with 15 tentacles discovered off the coast of Florida. It seems like every new species and discovery that we make gets wilder and wilder, almost to the point where people don't want to believe. But I want you to check out some of these marine species and let me know what you think about all this in the comments. Some of the 100 or so new species scientists believe they discovered amid the underwater mountains off the coast of Chile. They were found using an underwater robot capable of diving more than 14,000 feet. More than just enriching scientists' understanding of ocean life, Researchers say it demonstrates how the Chilean government's ocean protections are bolstering biodiversity and providing a model for other countries. This unknown species of sea toad looks like something Dr. Seuss might have created. It was found under more than 4,500 feet of water. Behold the beady-eyed gaze of a squat lobster resting in coral about 2,200 feet below the surface. Just before this member of a rarely seen family of whiplash squid had its picture snapped, it squirted ink. Perhaps a reaction to seeing an alien looking object alongside it more than 3,600 feet down. Film festival in the world and we get to come here early. This is the sixth annual. Ten years from now, we're going to say we were here first. Gannon. Make some noise, guys. This Woo. is a big deal. No, no, your honor, I did not convert a shed into a tiny house. That would require a permit. What I have built here is called a gravity ship. It harnesses the power of the Earth's gravity to latch on to the planet and then ride it around the sun. And the trip usually takes about 365 days. So the ship needs to have accommodations like a bed, a couch, and a kitchen. But at the moment, the county does not require a permit to build, operate, or sell a gravity ship. So I really don't see what the problem is here, Your Honor. Stupidity with the cameras, man. What's going on? Hey, I asked you a question. What's going on? You asked me a question? Yes, I said, what's going on? What's your name and badge number? It's right on my jacket. I don't know how to read, sir. You don't know how to read? Don't it's bully Gar me for that. It's Garcia, 745. What else All do you right. need? I don't need shit. Then don't talk to here? me like that. Why are you here? None of your business. Excuse me? None of your business. None of my business? No. What is okay. wrong with you? I don't owe you no, no answers or explanations. Well, I got a complaint about you, so I'm so going to find out. I have to investigate. Investigate them. Do you think? I'm asking you questions, which you refuse I to answer. I plead a fifth. Okay. Well, then I'm going to have to ask you to leave the area. Ask me to leave? Are you yeah. bugging, bro? I'm on a free sidewalk, G. You heard? Public sidewalk. Owned by my people who pay taxes. You, you don't tell me Miami what Beach? to do. You live here on Miami Beach? None of your business. I plead a fifth, I said. Hi, how you doing, sir? That'll be better. Now, I'm asking you a question. Blah, 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 blah. You work for me, my G. I, really? I work for you? How you doing, sir? How are you? Not bad, thank you for asking. What's your name, Ambassador? My name is Wyatt. My is Wyatt. A pleasure, brother. So, like I was saying, don't fucking talk to me like I'm a fucking animal, bro. And, as I said, there were the two cases of false flag terrorism. And these were the cases that made my ex-partner and I quit and decide to go public and blow the whistle on MI5. And the first one was the bombing of the Israeli embassy in London in 1994. Now, in this case, two Palestinian students were arrested and they were tried and convicted and sentenced to 20 years in prison each for conspiring to cause this explosion. And yet MI5 had information that Mossad, the Israeli intelligence agency, had actually bombed its own embassy. And it had done that for two reasons. One was to um, increase security around all the Israeli assets in London. They were always hassling for it. And MI5 was always saying, no, 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 there's not a threat. But they also wanted to shatter a, pol a Palestinian political support network, which was operating in London at the time, and which these two students belonged to. And the lead investigator in MI5, whose code number was, his sort of James Bond number was G91, had seen all the evidence and all the intelligence and he made that official assessment that Mossad had done this. And the second case was the, the real case that made us quit. This was the case of MI6 funding the assassination attempt against Colonel Gaddafi of Libya. Now, they did this illegally, outside political control. They didn't get prior permission to do this. And they paid about $100,000 to a group of Islamic extremist terrorists, as they were called in those days. Now, of course, we all call it Al-Qaeda to try and assassinate Gaddafi. Now, they, obviously it went wrong. Gaddafi's our new best friend, um, pushing lots of big, fat, juicy oil contracts towards our, our companies. But 
of course, innocent people ended up getting hurt, not only when the explosion occurred, but also in the ensuing security shootout. I think in total, 11 innocent people died that day because MI6 became a state sponsor of terror. So what can you do when you're working in an agency like that? In the UK, we have a law called the Official Secrets Act. So if you ever talk to anyone ever about what you saw when you were working there, you go to prison, not the people who conspired to commit murder. So we left and we went on the run and uh, we ended up living in exile for three years because we decided to report the crimes of the spies. And I was arrested, fam family members were arrested, friends, supporters, journalists, some were arrested, some were even convicted for trying to help us in this process. And of course, David Shaler went to prison not once but twice for blowing the whistle on murder on the part of MI6. So I just raised that because, of course, the issue of false flag is a historic reality. I mean, it's not just us talking about it. All you have to do is listen to women talk. They tell on themselves constantly. This, let me make it easier to read, this is more common than you think. My sister getting married in two days on the phone with her ex from 13 years ago just to make sure that she can't marry him instead. I made this map for an old video. I'm going to expand on it soon. I'm basically going to explain why loose morals result in social and civil decay. So here's a preview. This girl calling her ex is not a new or a rare thing. This map was my response to a video about a guy who met a girl, fell in love, proposed to her after three years. She said no. He proposed again after one year. She said no again. And he tried to break up with her, which she didn't want to do. Even her family pressured him to stay with her. This was confusing to him because if you don't want to accept the proposal, what are you waiting for? And we never got an official answer, but I'm pretty sure that the answer is a different guy from her past who broke up with her a while ago, and she's waiting for him to come back and replace him, even though he's not planning on doing that. He's busy. So basically, loose morals are destructive because without social constraints that result in stable marriages, women tend to fall in love with men who consider them temporary. Notice the orange line, meaning that she's just a for now thing for him. And then when those same women find men who give them real love and support, they don't appreciate it because in her mind, she almost got married to this guy, even though he does not agree. So then even though this guy gives her all of this support and commitment, she is still holding out for better, even though better is never coming. And men who give this investment to women and are not appreciated for it, well, they tend to get pretty upset and then they stop doing it. And if men are not investing in society, it's not going to stay standing. So if we have free love, then women start thinking they can do better than they can. And then nobody likes each other. Because remember, this is most people. And when people get hurt enough, then they stop putting in effort and they become angry and selfish. And you cannot have a functioning society of angry, selfish people. So it turns into this. What can we do about this? First of all, be this guy if you can. Become the guy that she would leave someone for. Second of all, don't make her do that. Don't have these relationships with women. Stop ruining them. When you say to a girl, oh, babe, I, I just don't know where the wind is going to blow me. I don't know where I'm going to be in three weeks. What they hear is I'm almost in the top category. I have a 90% chance of making it here. I just have to try a few more tricks. That is what they believe, even if you've never been seen with them in public. But of course, not every guy can make it here. So if you are in the majority, then what you need to do is vet your woman, check on her past, see if there is a different guy she is waiting for. That is not good for you. This guy spent four years and God knows how many dollars trying to make her happy. And she was never going to be happy with him because she was expecting the guy who's not coming. So if she says to you, my past shouldn't matter, just gently remind her that her past might cause her to leave you at the altar and that this matters to you a whole lot. All right, that's it for today's session. Please let me know your thoughts in the comments. I hope you enjoyed this video. Please click the like and subscribe button if you haven't already. Thanks again everyone for showing up and I will see you around.